chapter 13 returns us to the Red House for the party, which has been interrupted by chapter 12's focus on Molly Farron's approach uh, and her revengeful attitude and her drug-induced haze, which results in her death and results, in a sense, uh, in the gold being returned to Silas through the child, th through Epi, who's yet to be named Epi. Um, and in returning to the Red House, uh, George Eliot really focuses early on on the spirit, the level of jollity that has, has been achieved at the Red House as part of this New Year's celebration. Uh, she, she says that bashfulness itself had passed into jollity. She talks about uh, Kimball's uh, reckless profligacy, his kind of sense of recklessness that's resulted from his joy, probably his drunkenness, um, and the playing of cards that's going on. She talks about a, the, the, the spirit of the party has reached a pitch of freedom and enjoyment. Of course, all of this is to emphasize um, the contrast that's about to come once Silas enters with the baby. We know um, that the news of Molly's death and the arrival of Epi must find its way to the Red House. So she builds up this spirit of jollity in preparation for what comes next. Um, then in the chapter we get a reference to Bob Cass, who's Godfrey and Dunsey's brother, who we hear little about in the novel, but he's dancing a hornpipe. He is a representation at that moment of, of Squire Cass's last chance. It's kind of the last good son who's dancing around um, with joy. And then this spirit is broken by the arrival of Silas uh, with the child in his arms. And of course, all are suddenly interested in this, in this baby, where it w w will have come from. It's especially surprising to the Ravalovians that it comes in Silas's arms. And Godfrey is understandably anxious because he has some reason to wonder where this child might come from. In fact, he recognizes the child as his own, but doesn't know the rest of the story behind it. So his height of joy comes crashing down to a moment of intense anxiety. Silas reports then, not leaving Godfrey too much time to wonder, that the baby's mother is dead, though Godfrey can't be certain of this till he sees it with his own eyes. Um, Kimball, uh, Godfrey's uncle and the doctor, prepares to go to to verify that the, the woman is dead or to see if she might be capable of being revived. Dolly is sent for as, as the woman who always is wanted when uh, tragedy ensues because of her calm nature and her caring nature. And Godfrey accompanies them with Silas to the stone pits to, to see the woman who's died, which of course is Molly. Godfrey sees Molly uh, that she is genuinely dead and recognizes her and begins to consider his own good fortune, his own good luck. Chance, it seems, has helped him out after all, has come to his aid, which is what he was hoping for in previous chapters. Eliot keeps referring to that, capitalizes Chance as this, this abstract power that Godfrey sees as his potential savior. And it seems that it has come. Silas wants to keep the child. There is a sort of immediate connection which we'll look at a bit as we go on um, in looking at the chapter in more detail. So I've already mentioned that we, we should consider the structure of George Eliot's novel here, that she chooses rather than uh, to have Silas appear at the at the Red House with baby in arms without ever having shown us Molly Farron's approach and her death and the, reu the reunion between Silas and his gold, to interrupt that flow with that chapter and then return to the Red House. So that when we return to the Red House and its spirit, we have some anticipation for how the jollity of the party will react to and be depressed by the arrival of Silas. Or possibly that it won't even be depressed, but just scandalized by this sudden new sight that is completely unexpected. Have a look on page 98 at uh, the first arrival of Silas and how Godfrey sees it. Eliot chooses to show us this uh, moment 
revealed through Godfrey's eyes. Um, it's his awareness of this apparition that approaches that is our first awareness, or certainly the Red House's first awareness of Silas's approach. She writes, But when Godfrey was lifting his eyes from one of those long glances, they encountered an object as startling to him at that moment as if it had been an apparition from the dead. It was an apparition from that hidden life which lies like a dark by-street behind the goodly ornamented facade that meets the sunlight and the gaze of respectable admirers. It was his own child, carried in Silas Marner's arms. For Godfrey, it's a sudden haunting moment. This, this image of this apparition, this ghost, appears to him. It seems to return from the dead. Now, of course, that image might make us think um, of his hopes for the death of Molly Farron. It's suggestive of his attempts to suppress that life of his, this secret part of his life, into the past, almost as if killing it off. What's interesting as well is that the apparition, in the way that Eliot describes it, isn't clearly Silas or clearly the child. We have reason to suspect it's a reference to Silas because he's earlier described in that way, and we'll look at that in a, mi in a minute. But actually, at the end of this little section that I've described here, um, the, the apparition appears to be identified as the repetition of the pronoun it, it was his own child, so that the child itself seems to be the apparition, both together, Silas, and the child, yet to be named Epi, in his arms, appear as ghosts to Godfrey. And it seems purposeful that Eliot would want to confuse and conflate, to com kind of combine those two characters, Silas and Epi here, already in the way they approach Godfrey. If you think back to the rainbow, um, and we had in chapter 6 a long discussion of a kind of ghost story within Ravelo that was passed around, people not, not uh, daring to approach the barn for fear of a ghost, and then the beginning of chapter 7, this is just after Silas has lost his money, he appears in the rainbow, and Eliot describes his appearance thus. Yet the next moment, there seemed to be some evidence that ghosts had a more condescending disposition than Mr. Macy attributed to them, for the pale, thin figure of Silas Marner was suddenly seen standing in the warm light, uttering no word, but looking round at the company with his strange, unearthly eyes. The long pipes gave a simultaneous movement, like the antenna of startled insects, and every man present, not excepting even the sceptical farrier, had an impression that he saw not Silas Marner in the flesh, but an apparition. For the door by which Silas had entered was hidden by the high screen seats, and no one had noticed his approach. Mr. Macy, sitting a long way off the ghost, might be supposed to have felt an argumentative triumph. So, not long after Silas discovers his money missing, he goes for help. It's one of those few moments where he actually seeks out the companionship of Ravelovians with a very motivated purpose. In that moment, he's described through their view as an apparition. In this moment, he appears again to be described as an apparition. It happens to be the moment when, in a sense, his gold has been returned to him. So... There seems to be some mirroring and patterning, patterning of images that Eliot is using to draw together these two moments, the moment of loss and the moment of rediscovery or reunion with his gold um, through the, the child. So again, we've already been invited to see in the previous chapter Epi's appearance through her golden locks and through the references to gold as the recovery of gold for Silas. But this image of him repeated from earlier again seems to emphasize it. What is really crucial in this chapter is how we get to see Godfrey and how we are invited to judge him as, as readers. Um, we already don't necessarily think too highly of him. We know that he's been lying and keeping secret. His marriage to Molly, he's abandoned her, uh, he's allowing her to care for the child, or, well, we don't know how well she cares for the child. We know that she's... Um, She's an addict, an opium addict, and uh, 
he's doing nothing to actually help her or to help his child in this situation. So we already have quite a harsh feeling towards him. But the way he will react to this appearance of his child gives us yet more opportunity to judge him. It really does put him to the test, an ultimate proving ground, and I think he fails. Um, his immediate thought is to, to hide, to mask the truth, to remain in control of the secret that he's maintained. Elliot writes on the bottom of page 98, that Godfrey joined them immediately, unable to rest without hearing every word, trying to control himself, but conscious that is, anyone noticed him, they must see that he was white-lipped and trembling. Sorry, that should be conscious that if anyone noticed him, they might, they must see that he was white-lipped and trembling. Right, white-lipped, trembling. That the physical manifestations of his panic, of his fear, are unable to be masked despite his best efforts. That he has this conflict where he wants to get close to the child, close to what Silas is, is saying, selfishly to find out if it's true that this woman, Molly, the child's mother, his wife, is dead, because that's significant for him. But he also fears that the physical manifestations of his fear will be seen. And then on page 99, Godfrey felt a great throb. There was one terror in his mind at that moment. It was that the woman might not be dead. That was an evil terror, an ugly inmate to have found a nestling place in Godfrey's kindly disposition. But no disposition is a security from evil wishes to a man whose happiness hangs on duplicity. He again is attempting to mask the truth that's going on inside him from those outside. But think about the language that Eliot uses to describe his internal conflict. Um, he's feeling a throb, so this this has a vi he has a visceral response to this uh, this fear and anticipation that's vibrating within him. Um, and she she uses uh, the, the word evil, the words evil terror, the phrase evil terror to describe both its power over him, but also to kind of judge his terror. He fears she might not be dead, which means he wishes that she is, uh, he hopes that she is. This is an evil thought, of course, wishing somebody's death with no, no less your wife's death. Um, and she uses the the noun inmate, which suggests some a uh, sense of imprisonment. Um, this evil thought is like a, in, a criminal imprisoned in his mind, um, and it's and yet she uses the contrasting diction of a nestling place, which sounds cozy and comfortable. So this evil is actually at home within Godfrey's mind. Um, it contrasts with his kindly disposition, but the kindly disposition is just an outward sign that he, uh, a guise that he projects to others. It's not really completely his true disposition. It almost seems that this evil that sits within him, is imprisoned within him, is, is at least as natural as that kindly disposition. And again, it, um, his hopes hang on duplicity, that he must mask the truth, he must be duplicitous, double-sided, he must present this kindly disposition while harboring these, these criminal thoughts within him in order to get what he wants, which is Nancy, which requires the suppression of Molly's truth. Um, again, Eliot gives him a real chance to tell the truth. And it kind of projects forward because this lie that he's about to tell Nancy um, makes us wonder what will happen next if if Godfrey's able to take advantage of Molly's death and then marry Nancy. At what point in the future might this truth come out? And how significant will it be in this moment that he doesn't take advantage of the opportunity for truth? What child is it? said several ladies at once. And among the rest, Nancy Lameter addressing Godfrey. I don't know. Some poor woman who has been found in the snow, I believe, was the answer Godfrey wrung from himself with a terrible effort. After all, am I certain? 
he hastened to add, silently in anticipation of his own conscience. So he, of course, pretends not to know. I don't know. Pause. Thinking of a way make it seem true that he doesn't know, and yet to try to tell her what he does know without it seeming that he knows more than he wants to let on. Some poor woman, she becomes vague. He effaces the truth of Molly at that moment through that phrase. Um, and again, she Elliot uses the verb wrung from himself, as if it requires effort. It's uh, a, a twisting of truth through that verb choice. And then there's the, the parenthetical thought, this self-deception, which of course is hidden in the brackets, just as it would be hidden from Nancy in this moment, where he's trying to convince himself that he's not committing some, some act of deception towards the woman that he loves and hopes to marry, that it's possible that he can't be entirely sure who this, who this woman is, who the child's mother is, because he hasn't gone to see it's possible that he's confused. He anticipates his own conscience, which does indicate to us that his conscience exists, but he decides not to let it control um, and control him, and he goes ahead and tells a lie. Elliot continues to develop this feature of his internal conflict and his, his leaning towards deception in this passage from 101. Dolly says to him, Well, sir, you're very good. You've a tender heart, said Dolly, going to the door. Godfrey was too painfully preoccupied to feel a twinge of self-reproach at this undeserved praise. He walked up and down, unconscious that he was plunging ankle-deep in snow, unconscious of everything but trembling suspense about what was going on in the cottage and the effect of each alternative on his future lot. It's again that reference to his future lot. We get that a few times. Um, Margarita has made the point a couple times about the lottery at the beginning of of the novel that that decides Silas's fate in Lantern Yard and this element of chance which seems not to relate to our behaviors or our actions and the potential consequences so much as what might just happen to us, what might be our fortune, our chance, which we know well is what Godfrey's relying on. She refers to it again here, but definitely showing it as a selfish, self-centered quality of Godfrey's that he's hoping for good fortune out of somebody else's misfortune. She has that repetition of unconscious in the phrasing here, which suggests he, he's walking almost zombie-like through this snow towards the revelation of his fate. And although Godfrey was too preoccupied with a twinge of self-reproach, oh sorry, too preoccupied with pain and anxiety to feel self-reproach, it's implied he should feel self-reproach, and we certainly are annoyed at his lack of self-reproach and through and by Dolly's praise is a bit of dramatic irony. Dolly doesn't know um, how little he deserves her praise in this moment, so her praise, coming from a woman whom we respect, is difficult for the reader to take. I'm going to continue where I left off after Future Lot. No, not quite unconscious of everything else. Deeper down, and half smothered by passionate desire and dread, there was the sense that he ought not to be waiting on these alternatives, that he ought not that he ought to accept the consequences of his deeds, own the miserable wife, and fulfil the claims of the helpless child. There we have a, a list controlled by these these verbs accept, own, fulfil. It's a sense of obligation. It is that conscience within him, the voice of morality speaking to him, but it's been half smothered by passionate desire and dread, so that it's drowned out, that voice of responsibility is drowned out by his own desires. But he had not moral courage enough to contemplate that active renunciation of Nancy as possible for him. He had only conscience and heart enough to make him forever uneasy under the weakness that forbade the renunciation. 
and at this moment his mind leapt away from all restraint toward the sudden prospect of deliverance from his long bondage. I feel there that Eliot really does get inside Godfrey's head. It's from his perspective that his experience of maintaining white lies, or even quite dark lies, uh, is a form of bondage, of enslavement for him. Um, he feels the potential for freedom through somebody else's suffering and death. And then I wonder what we think of this uh, when Godfrey decides to give money to Silas, who says that the child should remain his until somebody else has a rightful claim on it. Of course, Godfrey is the one who has the rightful claim, but isn't willing to admit it. Poor little thing, said Godfrey, let me give something towards finding its clothes. Sorry, poor little thing, said Godfrey, let me give something towards finding its clothes. He had put his hand in his pocket and found half a guinea, and thrusting it into Silas's hand, he hurried out of the cottage to overtake Mr. Kimball. Ah, I see it's not the same woman I saw, he said as he came up. It's a pretty little child. The old fellow seems to want to keep it. That's strange for a miser like him, but I gave him a trifle to help him out. The parish isn't likely to quarrel with him for the right to keep the child. That final clause, the parish isn't likely to quarrel with him for the right to keep the child, almost seems a, an attempt to urge others to hear his view that Silas should be allowed to, that it seems only natural that having found the child and rescued the child, Silas should be allowed to keep it. It's very possible that many in the parish would question Silas's right to keep the child. Silas, who's been uh, disconnected from Ravelo's society, who's been a bit suspicious, um, people have, have questioned his potential evil intent by not sharing his knowledge of herbs. They expect him to be able to to cure their ills, and he doesn't. So people might very well want to question his right to keep the child. Godfrey's trying to make sure that he does keep it, possibly because he suspects that by keeping the child and raising the child, Silas, with his miserly ways, will keep the child out of the public eye as well, and reduce the potential for questioning about where that child has come from. Um, he, st he clearly lies He's made up this lie about having seen a woman anyway, and then he says it's not the same woman that he'd seen. So his lies continue. But it's really this this reaching into his pocket to give money to Silas to take care of it. It's a way of almost turning his sense of responsibility into only into financial obligation rather than into a humane, um, fatherly affection for the child. This must make him look a little bit inhumane to the reader. This is quite a complex quote which comes uh, just after Godfrey returns to the Red House after having been uh, at Silas's. And he's having a conversation with his uncle. And, and it seems that his uncle has suggested to him um, some, some lie he could tell, because the uncle's wondering why he's been such a fool. And he says, Oh, everything has been disagreeable tonight. I was tired to death of jigging and gallanting, and that bother about the hornpipes, and I'd got to dance with the other Miss Gunn, said Godfrey, glad of the subterfuge his uncle had suggested to him. And then we get this quote. The prevarication and white lies, which a mind that keeps itself ambitiously pure is as uneasy under, as a great artist under the false touches that no eye detects but his own, are worn as lightly as mere trimmings when once the actions have become a lie. Well, I'm struggling with the final phrase here and exactly what she means by when once the actions have become a lie. I'm, I'm not even 100% sure what she means by the use of the word become here, but it could be... Um, that the actions have become a lie in the sense that the truth that Godfrey was trying to suppress and hide no longer needs to be suppressed and, and hidden. In, this, in one sense, um, he has no wife. He's been hiding the fact that he has a wife, and now he has no wife. The first part of the, the sentence I can, I think, explain, which is that she's, she's figuratively comparing 
um, the ambition of an artist who aims for perfection, but who can see flaws in his own work, to the person who wants to have a kindly disposition, wants a good reputation, wants a pure soul, and yet tells white lies, has these little faults, these little flaws in his painting and the image of himself that he can very well see, um, and which become a great burden to him. But once those little white lies no longer need to be told, um, or even we might say once he's been rewarded for them, then those little flaws can be worn as light as trimmings, as something rather insignificant, as just little light touches on the entire picture. That's a strained explanation of it, but ultimately that quote is suggesting that um, Godfrey no longer has to feel the burden of these dark marks of white lies on what he on his ambitious pure soul because the situation has changed he does however continue to deceive himself this is pages 103 to 104 and when events turn out so much better for a man than he has had reason to dread is it not a proof that his conduct has been less foolish and blameworthy than it might otherwise have appeared when we are treated well we naturally begin to think that we are not altogether unmeritorious, and that it is only just we should treat ourselves well, and not mar our own good fortune. Where, after all, would be the use of his confessing the past to Nancy Lameter and throwing away his happiness, nay, hers, for he felt some confidence that she should love him, that she loved him. As for the child, he would see that it was cared for. He would never forsake it. He would do everything but own it. Perhaps it would be just as happy in life without being owned by its father, seeing that nobody could tell how things would turn out, and that, is there any other reason wanted? Well then, that the father would be much happier without owning the child. There's that admission of truth right at the end of that, that paragraph where Elliot is getting inside Godfrey's head and showing how he's turning his good fortune into evidence that he actually deserves good fortune. He's convincing himself he's done no wrong, that the outcome of fate is a reward, therefore he must have done enough to deserve that reward. But Eliot, of course, means this satirically. She knows well, and she wants us, I think, as readers, to know well that he does not deserve this reward, and ultimately the truth will come out. The other key feature of this chapter is how we start to see Silas develop a bond with the child to be named later Epi. Um, she establishes this connection and I think wants us to admire Silas for the connection that is established pages 99 to 100, so the bottom of 99, um, it's suggested that Silas might not want to keep the baby, and suddenly, without warning, Silas says, no, no, I can't part with it, I can't let it go, said Silas abruptly. It's come to me, I have a right to keep it. Lots of uh, kind of short but certain emphatic outbursts here. The, these thoughts he hasn't yet had, they're just coming out naturally and instinctively. That's what she continues to say. The proposition to take the child from him had come to Silas quite unexpectedly, and his speech, uttered under a strong sudden impulse, was almost like a revelation to himself. A minute before, he had no distinct intention about the child. And yet, despite having had no distinction, uh, sorry, distinct intention before, his statement, his reaction to the thought of giving it up is, is confidently two short statements no no i can't part with it i can't let it go there's a, a sudden certainty that surprises him and then she continues this this uh, attempt to unify the baby and silas in this next paragraph on page 100 the child no longer distracted by the bright light and the smiling women's faces began to cry and call for mammy though always clinging to marner who had apparently won her through confidence. So, although she is crying for her mother, 
there's this comfort in this in this image of her clinging to Mara's tactile image of the two already beginning to be fused together. Um, and it maybe is highlighted through the clinging alliteration between clinging and confidence, that it is the confidence he's instilled in her already, instinctively, that causes her to cling. And we start to see the ways in which this connection that Silas feels, which is a surprise to him and everybody else, has the potential to transform him. Page 102. He turned immediately towards the hearth, where Silas Marner sat, lulling the child. So we have an image of warmth in the hearth. We have a, a, the soothing quality of Silas's fatherly instinct and ability to lull, to soothe the child. She was perfectly quiet now, but not asleep, only soothed by sweet porridge and warmth into that wide-gazing calm which makes us older human beings, with our inward turmoil, feel a certain awe in the presence of a little child, such as we feel before some quiet majesty, or beauty in the earth or sky, before a steady glowing planet, or a full-flowered eglantine, or the bending trees over a silent pathway. There's a sense of, of the sublime that Silas feels through Eliot's uh, images and, and comparisons to his experience of gazing at the child and all these connections with, with nature, um, these transcendent con connections with nature. The wide open blue eyes looked up at Godfrey's without any uneasiness or sign of recognition, so a sense of depth, wide open blue eyes, after just referring to the sky seems to suggest the similarity of gazing up in the the expanse of a sky and all that it has to offer us, which he can now see through her eyes, the sense of freedom that it gives him. Um, the child could make no visible, audible claim on its father, and the father felt a strange mixture of feelings, a conflict of regret and joy, that the pulse of that little heart had no response for the half-jealous yearning in his own, when the blue eyes turned away from him slowly and fixed themselves on the weaver's queer face, which was bent low down to look at them, while the small hand began to pull on his withered cheek with loving disfiguration. We often see Silas bent, but normally he's bent towards his work. It's the thing that sustains him. So this act of bending towards the child suggests again something else might sustain him in the future. We have some sense of, of fatherly affection from Silas here. Till anybody shows they've a right to take her away from me, said Marner. The mother's dead, and I reckon it's got no father. It's a lone thing, and I'm a lone thing. My money's gone, I don't know where, and this has come from I don't know where. I know nothing. I'm partly mazed. The connection that exists between Silas and the child is emphasized not only by what he says, but how he says it. There's this parallel structure in the phrasing. It's a lone thing. I'm a lone thing. My money's gone, I don't know where. And this has come from I don't know where. So there's balance on either side of those, those dashes. Um, which suggests this pairing, this suited pairing that is created between Silas and Ed. On page 102, there's some uh, an interesting narrative structuring device that Eliot uses where she points towards something that will be revealed later. Um, it's Godfrey thinking about um, the face of Molly Farron that he saw dead in the snow. He cast only one glance at the dead face on the pillow, which Dolly had smoothed with decent care, but he remembered that last look at his unhappy, hated wife so well, that at the end of sixteen years, every line in the worn face was present to him when he told the full story of this night. So we're told here already that at some point the truth will out, that he will have to confess the truth about this woman and who she was, and that it will happen in 16 years. So when the narrative later jumps forward 16 years, we're waiting for the moment when he has to tell this story. 